Ah, there you are. So hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Dmitry Starkov will defend the academic thesis considerations for quantifying vestibular function. And Dr. Starkov, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Um, so, dear Prorector, dear committee, dear friends and friends, I'm happy to present the result of my work, which is titled Considerations for Quantifying Vestibular Function. The object of my study is the vestibular system, which can be considered as a set of five sensory organs, which are sensitive to a certain type of head movements. So, for example, we have three semicircular canals, which detect, which detect head rotational velocities, and then the information from each sensory organ is used uh, to help us keep balance, orient in space, and stabilize our gaze during head movements. And an example of the destabilization is presented on this animation, where this man keeps his eyes on this red target while rotating his head to the left and right. And this, happening, this is happening due to work of the vestibular ocular reflex, a reflex which uses information from the semicircular canals about the head movement velocities. And then this reflex moves his eyes to the direction opposite of the head movement, but with the same velocity. And when the vestibular function is impaired, this state is called vestibulopathy. And in this case, the vestibular ocular reflex cannot move the eyes and no fixation of gaze remains anymore. And so hence, by testing the gaze stabilization, we can also evaluate the state of the vestibular function. And this idea is implemented in the test called video head impulse test. This test uses fast head movements. They're also called head impulses. And then we record the eye movements, so eye velocities, and also head movements, head velocities, and compare the traces. And in case of, in case of misalignment of the traces, we can suspect the presence of vestibulopathy. However, despite its simplicity, the test can be given in different ways. For instance, we can vary the head impulses. They can be differently directed. For example, they can be outward directed or they can be inward directed. Among which uh, the inward direction is more predictable because of, in this case, the impulses always start, stop at the same position. The impulses can be also given, delivered, done by the patients. And we call this active condition or an examiner can deliver these impulses to our patients. We call this passive conditions. And among, among which, active condition is more predictable because of, in this case, patients know everything about the impulse. And here we come to the first ob objective of my study, which was based on the question, actually, does predictability affect the test outcomes, the outcomes we use to discriminate patients from the healthy population? And in order to answer this question, we gathered a group of healthy people and tested them using different head impulses. And what we observed that the first finding was that the predictability indeed had an effect on the outcomes. Though this effect was pretty small, uh, when we compare directions, only directions inward versus outward, but only in passive head impulses. However, the effect became pretty much significant uh, when we compared active versus passive head impulses, regardless of the direction. And especially this fact is important for those who deal with, who deal with patients, for doctors, because of we advise them to use corresponding normative data to each type of the head impulse, especially for active and passive head impulses. The second type of variation is hidden in the ways how we implement the system. So uh, we have several devices, several systems available in the market. And these systems, we hit systems, differ significantly in many aspects. For instance, some systems use cameras placed, placed on the Googles. So in this case, uh, this is head fixed cameras. Some systems use cameras which are ground fixed and they're located in front of the patient's face. Also these systems use completely different ways of calculation the outcomes. And again, we come to the second objective of my study which was based on the question. So should we expect differences in diagnosis when we apply different systems in the same patient? And in this case, we tested our patients using three different systems. 
And what we observed that the system, the systems which used the same way of recording data, the Google Fix camera, produced pretty similar results. However, the third system, which used the ground fix camera, was very different in the outcomes. And this led to discrepancies in the, uh, in the diagnosis uh, for some patients. And this, is, this fact is important because of when we apply different systems, we obtain differences in diagnosis. And in this case, we advise to those who deal with the normative data to maybe account, to maybe account for this fact and to provide the normative data with the corresponding system it was calculated with. So by applying the video head impulse test, we can objectively evaluate the state of the vestibular function. We can also measure what patients can see. But this measure is called visual equity. It's what you usually measure with your eye doctors. In our case, this is happening during head movements. And we call this dynamic visual equity. And uh, because of dynamic visual equity uses the vestibular ocular reflex as one of the inputs, in case of vestibulopathy, a symptom of blurred vision might occur, which significantly reduces the quality of life of our patients. In order to test dynamic visual equity, we use regular eye charts and ask our patients to walk. And in order to improve the sensitivity of the test, we repeat this test, this test at three different speeds. Usually it's two, four, and six kilometers per hour. And since we already knew that the fun vestibular function uh, nature declines with age, this is called presby vestibulopathy, we also wanted to investigate the, this age effect on the dynamic visual equity testing. So we gathered groups of healthy subjects and also our patients, and we tested them and found the following that dynamic visual equity seemed to be pretty stable over age. And in this case, uh, especially from the clinical point of view, no suggestions and no corrections are needed. The second finding was that patients, all patients produce much less dynamic visual equity. And this again demonstrated the fact that the test is suitable for discriminating patients from the health population. And the third finding was that uh, the age and also in combination with, with the disease itself, uh, decreases the chances to accomplish the test at all necessary speeds, especially at four and six kilometers per hour. And this, this happens in both groups, in the healthy people and also in patients. And this fact, again, is important because of doctors should take into account when they, when they test patients that not all subjects can walk fast enough to have the test with sufficient sensitivity. Okay, now let me talk a bit about considerations on the uh, quantifying of the treatment effect with a very novel and invasive method, which is called vestibular implant. Actually, vestibular implant is just modification of the cochlear implant, which aims to restore hearing. In our case, the aim of the vestibular implant is to restore vestibular function. And we have already proven that this test is, uh, can restore both vestibular ocular reflex and dynamic visual equity during walking. However, I also wanted to ask what to do with patients who could not walk enough, fast enough. So in this case, in this case there, is a, there is a testing condition while our patients sit. And there is a test, a novel test, called the functional head impulse test. The idea of this test is pretty simple. It's pretty similar to the video head impulse test. It also uses head impulses. However, instead of recording the eye movements at the beginning of each impulse and during this impulse, we present a symbol on the screen in front of the patient. And then at the end of each impulse, we ask our patient to recognize the symbol. And this demonstrates how patients could see during the head movements. And also this is the score of the test. And we apply this test in a patient we fitted with the vestibular implant and we compare two conditions. Uh, so when the vestibular implant was off and on, and what we found that the score was improved by 75%, or in letters, it's from three correctly seen letters out of 16 to 15 correctly seen letters. And this is kind of promising finding, especially for research groups and doctors who deal with evaluation of the vestibular implant, because of in this case, uh, the test battery for vestibular implant evaluation can be increased by one more test. And the last uh, thing I would like to outline for today it's more technical, however, still very important. Uh, the data we collect from our patients, this is usually 
head movement velocities and eye movement velocities. And because of their recorded with devices, first they are subject to the flows of the these recorded devices, recording devices. And sometimes this this is expressed, these flows are expressed as noise and artifacts. And in order to optimize the analysis, to simplify it, and also to extract the very very sense of the trace of the outcome, we can apply different mathematical methods. One of which is signal feeding, which is quite spread in the world. And the idea of this signal feeding method is pretty similar because if we know which trace, which outcome we already expect, we can feed, we can reconstruct an, an artificial curve, and then fit it to the real outcome. And the best fit curve in this case is considered as the uh, as the outcome. And in this case, and from this curve, we calculate all the parameters. And the last objective for today uh, is based on the questions. So should we expect in this case, when we're applying such type of analysis method, differences in the outcomes we calculate from our patients with vestibular implants to evaluate the efficiency of the vestibular implant. And in order to answer this question, we tested, uh, we, got, we collected data from our patients uh, fitted with the vestibular implants and also from health people. And what we calculated the outcomes then from the row traces and also from the fitted traces. And we observed that uh, all four outcomes, these discrepancies between uh, these all four outcomes we use in our cl clinical routine uh, differed not that much, especially from the clinical point of view. And this demonstrated us from its finding that the test battery, the analysis battery uh, for such type of uh, evaluation of the vestibular implant can be increased by one more reliable test. So this is all for today, what I would like to tell you. Uh, so in summary, in summary, we managed to demonstrate that predictability of the head impulses affected the uh, video head impulse outcomes. And uh, also applying different systems which differ significantly in the ways of uh, implementation of the method uh, might lead to discrepancies in the diagnosis. Also, we observed that age and also the disease have a significant effect on the uh, chances to feel the testing of dynamic visual equity while walking. Also, we demonstrated the possibility of using the functional head impulse test to test dynamic visual equity restored with the vestibular implant. And the last, uh, we demonstrated that signal feeding is, is a reliable, reliable method to optimize the analysis of the vestibular implant data. So this is all. Thank you for your attention. I'm giving the floor to the prorector, and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So the opposition will be opened by Professor Wuerts. He is a chair in, uh, in physics at Antwerp University and is affiliated with the St. Augustina Hospital Antwerp. Professor Verweitz, would you start your opposition? And you have to unmute first. <clears throat> Thank you, sorry. Yeah, dear candidate, it's, uh, let me start with uh, congratulating you because it is a fine piece of uh, uh, physics, uh, statistics, uh, modeling, in your thesis, which I really, uh, I think it really lifts the, the field of uh, vestibular science to a higher level. And therefore I also would like to uh, give my congratulations to your promoters. Uh, but I'm here not only to say, wow, but also some give some critics. It's nice that you say like the, the functional hit is indeed um, showing the result. And it's, it seems like the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And that is a very nice example of that. My questions regarding um, the three systems, I will only um, restrain myself to one question on that because it is a very, very interesting and actually, in my view, even a revolutionary chapter. Um, if, I, if you allow me to say it, the past 15 years, we have been confronted with the VHIT by certain groups in the world who said, oh, forget the Calrex, uh, forget all the other tests, do only VHIT, and then you know the answers to all the questions which there are. And now you showed very nicely that it's not so uh, as they say. And so I'm very happy for your criticism and uh, of your collaborators that you, you unraveled um, that there are some hic hiccups. 
One of the things which is interesting in there is the fact that um, you say there is a misclassification because based on the different of, of the different systems. Now, in that classification calculation, did you take into account the random classification? In the sense, like if you have a, a couple of possibilities, even by chance, you can come up with the right with the right classification. In statistics, it's called kappa statistic. Did you mm -hmm. take this random classification into account when you were calculating that? I think it was 75% or something like that. Uh, hi, Listina Bonin. Thank you for your question. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you were talking about the three systems mm -hmm. and the random classification regarding the, the discrepancies. Because yeah, of the, the, so for the pathology, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually we didn't take this into account while testing our patients. The only thing that we did during testing that we checked uh, the learning effect when we apply different systems because they were not applied simultaneously. So it was in, in order. Uh, that's why we compare the first and the last traces, uh, the, the, the first and the, the last uh, experiments uh, to find possible learning effect. And we observed that this learning effect was not detectable with the, with the given sample size and with the given differences. Uh, so um, probably this is all. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, it's it it could have been taken into account, but on the other hand, it, the publication is already accepted. So actually, the review should have uh, made also this comment, but that's uh, that's no problem. Regarding the vestibular implant itself, mm -hmm. um, if you look at a, as a tool to restore vestibular function, there are like two approaches: being the approach for the restoration of the VOR, and on the other hand, also the uh, the avoiding falls. Uh, because of uh, um, imbalance due to a misdetection of gravity. And therefore, I refer to the otolith system. What is your uh, approach in this? What would you suppose you would uh, look at? You look at both systems, the pros and cons, and how would you further elaborate on the difference between those systems? Halistin uh, Taponen, thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, that uh, in this case, well, plan uh, the stimulation on the, the semicircular canals. Uh, this is only a restoration of the vestibular ocular reflex mainly. And applying the stimulation for the otolith organs is uh, yet to be, uh, as far as I understand, it's yet to be uh, understood well, because of uh, we still do not really understand the uh, function of the otolith organs. So we, we yeah, we, of course, we have some comprehension about this, that it detects gravity and the head movement and translation head movements. But before applying the stimulation to this autolytic system, we also need to understand precisely uh, what's the exact function of these organs. And uh, also, I would like to just add maybe that uh, maybe we should not uh, complicate that much the 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 stimulation because of uh, we also need, need to take into account the learning effect. So our patients which are implanted with the vestibular implant might learn to compensate or to, to deal with the imbalance with swelling uh, by, by using already sent information to the semicircular canals. So, and this is yet to be studied as well. Thank you. Okay, okay. Regarding the V hit and the hit, um, so actually it is very nice to see on your movies when you show the movies of the v hit they you you can hardly see uh, a abnormality because the streaming makes such that actually the high frequencies are taken out so you don't actually see a lot if you show movies of the v hit now in reality obviously when you look at the patient direct per from one person to another person you're not streaming data, you're looking at real time. So you see, you pick up sometimes much more than you would expect. So if you would compare the V hit with the hit, would you say, well, the hit is not really very reliable. I only rely on the video head impulse test and not on the clinical um, experience of the examiner. 
uh, at least in the point. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I, I just I, I will never I will never exclude the proficiency of the examiners, of course. So the VHEAT is still a usable test, especially for, from the from the for the first glance. Uh, but however, I, I rely more on the on object, objectivization. So using the video head impulse test, we can also record. Uh, of course, it depends on the frequency, a uh, sample frequency of the system, and how much how much in, in, how, how much information we can observe from this system. Uh, however, yes, uh, in this case, I would more rely on the system on the video head impulse test because of, we can also see the saccades, and especially covered saccades, which are covered with the head impulse, head movements. And this might, of course, compromise the head impulse test. OK, yes, I like that question, uh, the answer. My last question is uh, very simple. When I do the head, the head impulse test, I move the patient from one side over the midline to the other side. So I don't go this, neither I go like this. So just from one side to the other. Do we call this inward or out outward? Uh, from the highly, highly in the point, thank you for your question. Uh, from the in the terms of predictability, I would call it inward, because of patients in this case they they are aware of the direction, and maybe they might also produce the same uh, pattern of uh, the response as they do with the invert analysis. Okay, thank you for your answers, Doctor. I'm uh, I'm done with my questions, Mr. Project. Sorry. Very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Van Bentum. He is from Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and his chair is a chair in ENT surgery. Professor Van Bentum. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear candidate, uh, congratulations with your nice body of research that you've produced. It's well written, and methodology is nice, and I will always also extend the Congratulations to your supervising team. It's nice work. But of course, I do have a few questions with which I uh, uh, want to talk to you about. Also, chapter three, which is very interesting. And Professor Rouse let me ask uh, a question to you, which he wanted to ask himself as well. So, Starting out, additionally, a, you, uh, a quote uh, from your chapter. Additionally, while Vorgays did not significantly differ between the intraacoustics and automatic system, they both significantly differed from Vorgays obtained with the synapsis system. So, um, and then you say, when the synapsis system considered a patient no uh, BV, this was always in agreement with the other systems, but not the other way around. BV with synapses and no BV in the other two uh, systems also occurred. So it's very safe for, 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 for um, the synapsis system because it best detected uh, BV. And uh, what should we do? What, what's your preference in terms of, I mean, I want to buy a new one. Which one should I buy? Hello, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, of course, uh, the synapses produced much more tendency to the to the BV. Uh, but this has happened mostly, according to my opinion, this has happened mostly because of you have already selected patients which are, which had the severe vestibular impairments. Uh, of course, we apply different tests like calorics, rotator, chair. So we excluded the function of the video head impulse test. Uh, regarding the choice, uh, which system is the best, uh, I will stick to the technical uh, aspects of the system characteristics. Uh, as far as, in this, as, I know, as I remember, the system, synapsis systems, uh, it uses, it obtains information from the, uh, uh, from, the, from the image of the face in comparison to the, for example, for instance, automatics or interacoustics, which uh, obtains information about the, only the eye moment from the image of the eye. And in this case, of course, we lose the spatial resolution uh, because we cannot afford too much resolution to be fast enough to transfer a lot of information about the head moments. And also what I observed that uh, apart from losing the spatial resolution, the synapse system loses also time and resolution. 
So in comparison to the systems, to other systems, which uh, had the sample frequency of approximately 220 Hertz, the Synapsis system had uh, the sample frequency of 110 Hertz. And based already on these characteristics, of course, I will stick to other systems. And also the uh, one, again, one more uh, reason why I will do this, that these two systems agreed more with each other. Okay, so I understand this, but on the one hand you say, you, uh, well, you're a physicist, so you like technique, but I'm a, I'm a clinician and I like usability. So if the yeah. synapsis system is in BV diagnosis preferable, I'd, I'd like to use that one. Do, do, do you understand that? Or do I have to buy all three because in different situations you uh, need uh, uh, another system? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your, for your comment. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, if we tend to the, uh, to the diagnosis of the bilateral vestibular opacity more, just uh, we, we need to have more uh, false negative results than false positive. To be completely sure that the, the we diagnosed our patients, yes, I will stick to the synapsis system. However, you. you know, ah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there's another thing that you you uh, you did. You made a very valuable suggestion, and and uh, you said, well, it's necessary that uh, VA systems are are standardized regarding eye and hair tracking methods and for gain calculation algorithms. So how should we go about this? I mean, we have a Barani society. We have a couple of more societies in, in life. Uh, we've got manufacturers. How should we go about to organize that we have standardized technical specifics? Thank you for your question. Yes, it's a serious question, uh, how to organize all these uh, changes to the methodology we apply to test our patients. Probably in reality, it's not that possible as it could be. As we, as we expect. Uh, however, we can maybe simplify this by um, not standardizing by the systems, but maybe we can use the methods. So for instance, we can uh, just determine the way of collecting the data, how we record our head movements and eye movements. And from this point, of course, we can already uh, classify uh, better the, the standard values we apply. And also what's more important, What's more important for me, uh, it's the ways how we calculate the outcomes, especially the gain value. Uh, because of, there are different ways. There are many methods how to do this, and they all differ, and they all subject to different flows. Uh, and of course, in this case, uh, it will be preferable to choose the only one uh, and maybe to use it always. Because of, in this case, we don't need to change a lot in the technical aspects of the systems, but we can change the software. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask a question on chapter four. The present study, and this is a quote from your, from your chapter, the present study did not find any effect on the age on DVA. Uh, but another quote, it would be recommended to use age-matched controls when testing DVA in research settings. So why should we use age, um, age-matched con controls when you also say that uh, you did not find any effect of age on DVA? Thank you for your question. Yes, indeed. Uh, in this case, we still recommend to use age normative values because of uh, we applied um, we didn't find any significant differences, uh, influence of age on dynamic visual equity. However, we could not rule it out because of maybe in this case, uh, uh, there are many aspects which could cover the influence. For instance, because of we, for instance, we uh, different people with different age walk differently. For instance, whilst uh, Young people feel quite confident while walking. Elders try to minimize the head movements 
and this affects the, the vestibular reflex as well. Also, short and tall people walk differently at the same speed. Some uh, tall people are, can, can walk at six kilometers per hour and short people start running. And again, this affects the hand movements and also the vestibular reflex. Uh, also, maybe the sample size of our groups wasn't enough to uncover this effect of age because of, uh, we had sometimes in just a few patients in some certain case of, of, of the age. And that's why uh, we still recommend to use just to be completely sure that there is no age effect. And of course we propose uh, and also we advise uh, continuing with the future study of this effect. Okay, so better be safe than sorry. Yes, exactly. So age matching. Okay, thank you. Last question about the vestibular implant. Uh, well, it's positioned and stimulates, it stimulates mainly the ampullary nerves. So, and this is a more philosophical question, I think. What do you think is the contribution of the not stimulated otolib organs to the DVA? Because when you measure the DVA in terms of correct words, uh, uh, you, you, you see that it's almost normal when stimulate, when it's on. It's 15 out of 16, uh, I, I remember. So does the otolith organs do not add anything to DVA or do we need better testing? Uh, hello, Stephen Point, thank you for your question. Um, uh, yes, uh, maybe uh, I, I will stick to the answer I already gave previously that maybe it's not necessary to complicate the stimulation uh, if it's sufficient to obtain the very nice uh, improvement of the dynamic visual equity stimulating only the sensocular canals. Of course, there is a, such a, a, a term uh, like a translational vestibular ocular reflex, which also might affect the dynamic visual equity. Uh, however, we have not tested this yet uh, in, in, in condition of translation head movements. And this is a very interesting topic for, for the future studies. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Candidate. And I'd like to uh, conclude my opposition hereby, uh, Mr. Co-Rector. Thank you, Professor. Um, the opposition will be continued by Professor Peters. He has a chair in mathematics and knowledge engineering at the University of Maastricht. Professor Peters. Thank you, Mr. Co-Rector. And uh, dear uh, candidates, uh, first of all, also my congratulations on a very nice thesis. And uh, I would also like to extend that to the uh, supervisory team. I think it's very nicely written, uh, it reads well, and it is uh, very informative. Lots of uh, uh, topics that you uh, looked into methodologically. Um, and it contains quite a bit of statistics and mathematics and uh, single processing. So it is also in that respect close to uh, some of my interests. Um, I would like to, to start off by, by connecting to with the discussion that you just had with, with uh, Professor Van Bentham in particular. Um, and that was about uh, buying uh, one of, or maybe multiple of these uh, devices. Uh, and you, uh, in your answering, you briefly mentioned something about uh, false positives and false negatives. Uh, and that relates to my question, because in your study, you only had um, patients included. And that makes that uh, the, the right answer in all cases is that the devices should say that there is a case of uh, DV, right? Um, but why did you not include healthy subjects? Because that will relate to the uh, false uh, negatives that you could have. Uh, could, you, could you dwell on that? Um, would that help your study to, to give better uh, and deeper and more solid answers maybe? Uh, Hardly stand up one. Thank you for your question. Indeed, we didn't include healthy subjects. Uh, according to my knowledge, uh, as far as I remember, uh, this type of study had already been done before. Uh, however, however, of course, including healthy people in this, uh, in our in our study, you would benefit a lot on the on the improvement of the uh, calculation of the false negatives. Uh, However, our intentional goal was to investigate how these system, systems manage with, the, with our patients. Uh, so we wanted to first see uh, how it works with the patients in order to proceed further. 
And also, there was a just uh, like a very realistic problem that not all systems were available at the time. So we had to use three systems. We had to test all these all our subjects, and not all all patients were tested with, tested with the all three systems as well because of time limits and uh, business of the of the the systems. Yeah, because I think in general, if you're gonna apply uh, and use the systems uh, to uh new patients you haven't seen who may or may not have this pathology then you would also like to know uh, about the cases where actually there is no uh, disorder in, in, in the sense that you're looking for yes it could be something else of course yes yeah yeah so that 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 also is an aspect for well, yeah which system to buy i would uh, would always say uh, i had a very short technical question uh, just to make sure because in on page 60, you have a description of table one uh, and the numbers that should appear in there, but I saw different numbers in the table. So I think there is a kind of mismatch. Am I correct? And what would be the right numbers to, to have, those in the text or those in the table? Do you have this with you on page 60? Uh, There's table one. In, yeah. Hi, uh, listing one. Thank you for a comment. Unfortunately, I don't have... Uh... The, the PGTs in front of me. Okay. Then maybe that's something then later to, uh, to look into. Uh, yeah, okay, definitely. Which are the correct ones. I suppose those in the text are the correct ones, but uh, then the table should maybe still be adapted uh, if the paper isn't published yet. Um, then the other topic I would like to, to discuss with you is on uh, proposition number five that comes along with your thesis. That's a very open proposition, the way you formulated it. And it says that uh, the, for, for the, of the audience here, um, new methods of machine learning and deep learning can simplify diagnostics. I think in this very general form, we would all agree, uh, but then it's also not so exciting. So maybe you can elaborate on this a bit more and make it more specific to, uh, to your current topic on the vestibular organ. And uh, maybe also explain to me in, in which context you think that machine learning could help really. Uh, highly esteemed point, thank you for your question. Yes, indeed, machine learning and neural networks uh, will benefit, uh, uh, using this will benefit for us because of, uh, as, because of I worked a lot with the signal analysis of the traces uh, from our patients and from the health people. Uh, we had a severe problem with detecting of the circuits, for instance, the fast head movements. And uh, in some cases they were very visible, in some cases they are covered with the, with the, uh, vestibular local reflex, and it's really difficult to sometimes even with the naked eye, naked eye to to distinguish which is saccade and which is just uh, flotation. And this, in this case, application of machine learning, which could uh, learn based on, on on a lot of data to extract the very sense of this of this type of movement of this type of pattern, could benefit to help us uh, to reliably distinguish traces and not to rely on just people's opinion. Okay, I see. And uh, you just mentioned you need a lot of data. Do you think that, that makes it feasible and attractive? Uh, is it already at that stage? Or yes, uh, yes. Harry Stimovan, thank you for your comment. Yes, indeed, uh, this seems visible because of uh, uh, we have already collected a lot of data. Of course, we need more. And also, maybe uh, since we collect a lot of data from the same patient. So we, we conduct multiple traces, multiple head impulses. Uh, this might also be considered maybe as a nature of bootstrapping and just to, to help us uh, just to increase the sample size and to maybe have the nice classification. Yeah. Um, maybe then also some, something about the risks of using such methods because currently it's very much um, uh, being researched. Um, how how we as humans can understand better and be better convinced about why uh, algorithms come to certain decisions. Um, have you thought about that? Yeah, w would you like to elaborate on that? Highly yeah. important, thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, uh, applying the machine learning, just uh, the ways we classify, we not, not always we can just understand how, how it's done, especially it concerns the deep, deep learning because of just uh, regulation of the weights and in the structure of the neural networks. Uh, so in this case, uh, 
of course, there are some ways, there are some methods. I'm not an expert in this field, but I'm aware that we can uh, determine the pass uh, on weights which are activated to see, actually to, to decipher this pass as well, uh, just to understand how it, how it works. And maybe just simple simple models also would help us just because of it's not that uh, difficult task to distinguish, for instance, the cicades, because of their shape is more or less uh, consistent. Yeah, and um, maybe another issue also related to this that, that would be of interest. Um, very often the data that people have available is uh, somehow biased. So there may be uh, a lot of data about healthy subjects or very little data. Uh, certain pathologies may be overrepresented or underrepresented. Now, there may be no data at all about certain things. Uh, and that influences the kind of uh, classifiers that you build. Um, would you think there are particular issues in, in this case to also take care about? Uh, if, you, if you were to use it for the example that you uh, uh, had in mind. At least important, thank you for your question. Um, because of I'm not an expert in machine learning, though I just tend to, to study it in the future, I cannot really say the reliable, the very uh, detailed question about this. But indeed, yes, of course, some uh, deviation towards uh, some aspects uh, might uh, influence the classification methods we use. Uh, and in this case, uh, maybe just to overcome this problem, uh, these old methods of classification we apply, machine learning, neural networks, should be considered as uh, just help for doctors and also for research groups to, 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 to deal with, with such type of data and not to replace them, of course. Yeah, I fully agree with that, yeah. Okay, then uh, I would like to return the word to uh, the pro -rector. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Peters. Um, I forgot to mention that you're um, appointed uh, voluntarily as uh, secretary of this degree committee, and you were the chair of the assessment committee. Sorry for my omission. So we go to Dr. George. He is an additional uh, opponent, not a member of the assessment committee, and he uh, is a medical physicist at Maastricht University Medical Center in Audiology. Dr. George. Dear Pro-Rector, thank you for this opportunity. Dear candidate, uh, it was my great pleasure to reach your PhD thesis. Uh, I think it's a great combination of, on the one hand, highly dense information, but still readable. And I think that combination is quite rare. So my compliments to you for that. And also, of course, my compliments to your supervisory team. Congratulations on that. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to discuss with you some questions I have. Uh, finally, once more, we go back to chapter three, the gain. We know that different systems show different average gains. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on the methods that you tried to unify these gains? I mean, you could, for instance, compare the gain to a normalized group and, and standardize that, or you could derive a Z-score um, probably not only average gains, but also the standard deviations of the gains could be different. So have you tried methods to bring these uh, uh, items closer together? Uh, thank you for a question. Uh, in, indeed, in, the, in one of my chapters, I already uh, gave some uh, recommendations how to overcome the problem of different uh, differences in the calculation of the gains. Uh, it's also we should take care of the kids again kids especially the, which are covered there by the head movements uh, these are kids uh, significantly uh, they make our life much more difficult uh, because of they are not always recognized by the system software and according to my opinion uh, this was one of the most uh, reasons why we obtained such a significant difference in the systems uh, okay uh, because of looking at the raw traces of these three systems, I have noticed that, uh, yes, indeed, the saccades were not always recognized by the systems as well, which, of course, affected the, most of the gain al algorithm we use, we apply. Uh, however, however uh, we also don't know how the, how the synapse system calculates the, 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 the gains, because of this method was, uh, we, we couldn't uh, obtain the information from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And of course, this significantly, significantly uh, hampered the 
elaboration of this. Yep, exactly. So you need more transparency of the manufacturers, of course. Yep. Okay. If we go back to figure three on page 53, that's the, the figure that you also showed uh, in your presentation with the average gains, the three average gains for each patient. Um, what I miss in that figure is the test retest difference within a patient. That is, would the gain, if you remeasure the gain for a patient, would it be different? For instance, if one patient had a gain now of 0.5, if you would retest him in a week or so, would the gain then increase to 0.6 or point, decrease to 0.4? I mean, would, what would be the test retest um, deviation within a patient? Uh, highly esteemed point. Thank you for your question. Indeed, this uh, retest uh, we aspect we could not uh, we could not measure because of it, it will take too much effort uh, and also time uh, because of, we need to apply three systems in all patients. Mm -hmm. However, according to uh, to my opinion, uh, yes, of course the, the the gain values might differ in this case. Could you guess? <laughs> so the small um, difference. I mean, what would what would be the test do we test difference? If the software device, if the software of the devices could uh, detect all its case, so we already exclude one of the main reasons of this deviation. So I would expect the difference less than uh, 0 0.1, of course. Okay. Because of this should be more reliable. Of course, it depends on the conditions which our patients, our patients okay. are in. But that's still not negligible. So that's very interesting, maybe well, for future research then. <laughs> yes, agree. Uh, okay, a different topic then. To tap chapter two, I would like to take you. Um, you mentioned the PR score as a measure of saccade grouping. And then I quote, you mentioned at page 32, I quote, the PR denomination does not have any medical, medical or scientific significance. What? Do you mean by that? I mean, if that would be true, why would you report it? What what can we learn from this PR measure if it's not mathematical or scientific significance? Carlos uh, Timpon, thank you for your question. In this uh, in this sentence, I meant that uh, we could not find uh, a reasonable explanation why this this measure has this particular name. So the ah. PR score, and what we found that in the original original article, it was named by. Uh, the authors. This okay. Oh, you only mean the name. Okay. Yeah, I mean the only man. Uh, only the okay. Main. Okay. <laughs> That's a short question then. Um, I couldn't. Uh, you do a lot of measurements concerning head movements, and you really so uh, convincingly show an effect of these head movements in different ways. Um, what I couldn't devise from your conclusions is: okay, is this still a problem? Head movements, or can we adequately correct for them? What is your opinion on that? Are, you, are, there, are our models sufficiently now to correct for these uh, head movements? Harley uh, Stimopane, thank you for your question. As, as, as I understand, Kirk, uh, that you mean the difference in, in the head movements, yes? Mm -hmm. Can we correct for them to get an adequate um, uh, outcome of the vestibular system? Or is still, are our outcomes still hampered by head movements? Uh, yes, we can correct from some Mm, from some aspects of the, I, I tend to the learning of our patients or to the to learning how the examiners conduct the testing in order to have the uh, less variance of the head, head, head movements during the testing. Um, however, we also, that we know the fact that head movements also, they influence the vestibular organ reflex and also the gain values. So, but this, uh, we need to have a significant difference in the head moments to have significant, uh, to have a big difference from the clinical po point of view and the gain values as well. So in this case, proper training, proper instruct, in, uh, proper deliver of the instruction to our patients might facilitate, already might facilitate a lot to improvement of the situation. Okay, but it's still a problem. If we don't instruct our patients well, we cannot um, uh, correct for these head movements uh, adequately enough. Okay, yes. that's a major problem. So mathematics is not, does not solve everything, unfortunately. <laughs> um, maybe one last quick question, if I may, Mr. Prorector. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, in the same experience, uh, which you conducted with, uh, I think, healthy subjects, uh, 62 healthy subjects, yep, five 
were excluded from analysis because you were not able to perform adequate testing. That seems quite high to me. That's a 10% inclusion dropout. That means 10% not being able to perform the test. In a clinical setting, that would be hard. I mean, as an audiologist, we do audiograms and we can do that in, well, 99.9% .9 of all patients. And it's essential to do that. It's, so it might be a clinical problem if you use this test clinical. Um, what can we do about it? Do you have solutions or alternatives for this 10%? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, this is one of the side effects of applying video echolography because if it relies on the, how the pupil, which is recorded during, during the testing, is, uh, is, is seen. And of course, many aspects like eyelids and also mascara maybe could affect this. Uh, and also sometimes the size of the eye as well. And in order to elaborate this, in order to get rid of uh, this potential problem, uh, this might be beneficial to use uh, other methods to record the eye movements, uh, one of which uh, was presented by my colleague Maxim, which is the, uh, electrocolography, if I'm not mistaken. Though I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, so, Okay, but you would recommend to have that available in the clinical room to make sure that you also, you can measure this 10% also. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you for your suggestions and your answers. And uh, I will end my opposition here. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Kunst. He has a double affiliation. He works at the Radboud University Medical Center, but he's a professor of ENT surgery at the Maastricht. University Medical Center. Professor Kunst. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, for your uh, kind introduction. Dear uh, candidate, I would like to um, uh, ask some questions on uh, chapter six. And as you can imagine, uh, specifically focusing on the clinical part of your uh, research. And um, first, we start off in uh, chapter six. One of my main questions, actually, is quite an easy question for you. I, I'm missing something in that chapter. Do you know what I mean? Because I was very interested reading the chapter, but I was lucky. Uh, I can see it from you that you don't, don't uh, get what I, what I mean, my question. Um, I checked it on PubMed, but I was missing one of the tables. Table one and in chapter six, I couldn't find it, or at least in the PDF that was sent to me most recently, but I had a look uh, on PubMed, so I could find it there. Um, then I had a look at, uh, at the table, of course, and also on page uh, 109 and 110, it said that uh, baseline uh, stimulation also resulted in a positive uh, result. And um, then you, uh, your hypothesis was that maybe white noise boost that could, could cause this. But then after that, after switching off the device, you also uh, uh, found an uh, effect and you called it after effect. What do you mean exactly with after effect? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, we observed some evaluation of the Fancha Head Impulse Score uh, when we immediately after when we switched off the, the stimulation. And uh, this actually, this effect was not uh, really different from the score uh, we collected with the baseline stimulation. And in this case, we call this, we call this as an after effect just to point out that we observed this, it was still significant statistically. Of course, that's pretty difficult to give a, a reasonable explanation with only a single patient tested. Maybe uh, mm. uh, however, yeah, indeed. Uh, so in order to uncover this effect, uh, probably more patients need to be tested as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, so um, I can imagine uh, a lot of research still needs to be done before the definite uh, clinical implementation. Um, but, but if you uh, 
would try to find, imagine that you test more patients and you would found, find the same result. Um, probably have been thinking that over because it's quite striking, this result. But imagine if you test more patients and you would find the similar result. Because I, I presume that it's not by accident, accident that you find this positive result after switching off the device. Um, what could cause it? Do you have any suggestions yourself if you think about it? Or least important. Thank you for the question. Uh, this is a really difficult question to, to mm -hmm. answer. Are, are there any other factors? Um, um, because you have the, um, the tests that you do, you have the test results, uh, the heart more, uh, there's a physical test, but then also you have the uh, more patient-based maybe uh, perception, the perce uh, perception, vestibular perception tests. But if you then continue in that line, what could you, what else could you think of? Mm. Could, there, could there be something? Uh, um, maybe also um, you have patients uh, giving various responses also like you have the uh, vestibular uh, more patient type you have the ocular uh, type in uh, uh, keeping your balance um, so there are probably some other uh, some patient factors that also might be involved and, and also in other morbidity or uh, people uh, feeling not okay. Could there be something like a coping strategy uh, that I can, uh, you could maybe imagine that people with a, a handicap, that it also depends on the individual and uh, maybe coping strategy, could that also play a role? Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, yeah, I, I just I'm just thinking about maybe it's uh, it's this side effect is uh, is caused maybe by some other effect as well. So, uh, however, uh, because I think uh, I, I think it's very interesting actually, and we are now looking uh, from the side of more. The, the mathematics, uh, physics, but, but it could be very interesting to have maybe also a psychologist involved. Maybe there is one, but also in the project to see what, and I'm, I'm not saying, absolutely not saying that it's placebo, uh, but from certain um, uh, instability uh, uh, diseases like Meniere disease, we do know that there is the coping strategy of the patient is very important. Eh? How, how sick do you feel? Uh, how do you cope with the burden, the morbidity itself? Could, could that also play a role? Did you think it over or dis, did you discuss it within your uh, uh, research uh, group? Uh, Harley Stimpoint, thank you for your comment. Uh, particularly this uh, side effect. We, we, didn't, we didn't discuss it a lot, but I totally agree with you that this might be some kind of coping. Then uh, patients felt quite confident after improvement first and then uh, maybe they this change their comprehension of their symptoms as well. Uh, yeah. So for this, I will still stick to the fact that we need to yeah. collect more data. Yeah. And, for, and for sure it doesn't work because your table uh, does show it eh, because there's a significant difference. But I, I can imagine that there's also part of it uh, like the psychological factor, and you should uh, subtract it maybe even from the final vestibular uh, effects uh, that arises from the vestibular implantation. But I thought it was very uh, interesting uh, on itself. Um, then probably my uh, last question, if I have a look at the time. Um, if you have this vestibular uh, implant and uh, also in this patient you uh, you give stimulus but 
how does it work in real life? If people have the vestibular implant and they uh, walk around with a vestibular implant, they have this stimulus all day, but then they go to bed and switch off the device. Then suddenly there's no stimulus anymore. Um, how would a, a patient respond onto that? Uh, because we do know that if you have a stimular stimulus where you lose your vestibular function immediately, then it gives rise to instability and vertigo complaints. But now with a vestibular implant, you would continue the whole day wearing it. And then after switching off, what would be happening? Uh, hardly seem a point. Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, this might be uh, a problem when we apply the vestibular implantation and also ask our patients to use it daily. Uh, however, maybe uh, according to my opinion, that uh, this effect won't be that prominent, prominent as in case when you lose the, the vestibular function because of these patients, <coughs> probably most of them have already uh, have been. Ora asked. Well, you made uh, Mr. Candidate finish your sentence if you uh, have been Not obliged, uh, but but you can do it. Follow yeah, have, mm -hmm. have been have been living uh, for a long time with the impairments. And of course, they are already, uh, they are kind of trained to this. They are, they are, they are uh, habituated to these impairments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dimitri Starkov, the time appointed for de defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request uh, you and your company to await the results uh, of our deliberations and our return.
Dimitri Starkov, uh, the Degreed Committee, here present online, has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the Degree Committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Dr. van der Berg is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor, Dr. van der Berg, to now take the floor. Dear Prorector, thank you very much. Um, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Dimitri Nikolaevich Stakov, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beadle. And I think the beadle should show it, but it's mm -hmm. the screen is black. The screen is gone. I think we lost a video connection of the beetle. Yeah. Okay. But we will show it uh, when uh, she comes in. But I can be a guarantor that you will receive the uh, certificate. So, Dimitri, nevertheless, I would now say, dear Dr. Dimitri Starkov, I feel honored to be one of the first to congratulate you with your thesis. And we really know each other already for a long time. The first time we met, you were one of the first students between Tomsk and Maastricht. And we already noticed that you are a very hard worker, which also resulted in a very nice thesis. And you're also a man of few words. You're not a big talker, but you always, um, if you say something, your words make sense. And it's more deeds than words. And that's also something that we like, of course. And we also, um, for us, it was really nice to see that your way of working was very complementary to our way of working. Because from your the background in Russia, you already obtained a lot of in-depth knowledge. And you're really quick at solving tasks with precision and do it very quickly because where I sometimes suspected that some things would take you three months, you did it in two weeks. And it was also still a learning opportunity for you because the Dutch way is more problem-based and pragmatic. And that is something that you really learned to apply also. You actually combined best of both worlds, which also of course resulted in guiding this other PhD students and also master students. Because with your main strength, which is actually the signal analysis, I think you helped so many people that some other PhD thesis would not have been finished without your help, because you're really a team worker. And I know that if we ask you something, you will solve it no matter what. Which was also recently shown when we asked our Dutch team to solve something, and it took them half a year and they didn't succeed. And you did it in two months in your spare time and it really worked. So therefore I was really, really amazed. And during your time here, you also has had of course some challenge in your private life with which you dealt perfectly because you were here in the Netherlands while being married and you're having your whole family in Russia. And you really never complained, was always happy and friendly and kind to us. Now it's really a pity that you're not able to travel to the Netherlands since we would love to have you as a colleague and as a dear friend close to us in the Netherlands. So dear Dimitri, again, congratulations. And we wish you all the best in your new job and with your family, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. van der Berg. And perhaps I... So here we have your certificate. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Beadle.
Dear Dr. Starkov, also on the behalf of the Board of Deans and of the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences, I congratulate you with the honor that you have acquired. And I hereby declare this ceremony, ceremony to be ended and please remain uh, online to uh, have all the other committee members say something.